Sometimes you need to let someone go. It's not fun, but it's something every leader has to face sooner or later. Here's a roadmap to make things a bit easier. Hi entrepreneurs, I'm Vicki Brown and you're in the right place if you want to engage your team, boost your business and grow your leadership muscle. You know, there are a lot of reasons you may have to terminate someone's employment. Of course, the most obvious is that they just aren't doing a very good job. But aside from that, maybe you just have to reduce your payroll load by getting rid of some positions on your team. That's called a reduction in force or a RIF. But no matter the reason, letting someone go will never be the most fun part of your job as a leader. But it is the most important. Today I'm going to walk you through the process by focusing on the four D's. Decisions, Documents, Discussion, and Disengaging. So, first off you have to make a few key decisions that will determine the steps we have to take later in the process. Is this a termination for poor performance? If so, Hopefully you've been tracking their work and giving them feedback throughout. It's helpful if the feedback includes some sort of formalized warning process. Now I know the words warning process sound very official and intimidating, but in fact it should. An employee generally will only be put into a warning process after there have been a few conversations about where they need to improve and it looks like they still aren't getting it. Putting someone on warning is an opportunity for you to say, look, this is really an important issue and you have to clear it up. Otherwise, it might impact your ability to keep working here. After all, someone deserves to know definitively if what they're doing is a planet killer for their employment. And with going through the pre-warning and then warning conversations, you have done everything possible to make sure they aren't surprised when the termination actually happens. Termination should never a surprise. Even when you have to do a reduction in force, prepare the team. Let them know that all budget lines are being reviewed because of a drop in revenues or whatever, and that you will have more information within the next week or whatever time frame works for you. The next choice you have to make is when. Will the termination be immediate or for a future date? And if you choose a future date, do you want them to keep working until that time or just remain on payroll without doing any active work. When you select a future date that's more than a few days out, it's called a notice period. Now remember, you're not required to provide a notice period. That is, unless you're in California and you require employees to give you notice before they quit. That's right. If you have a policy somewhere that says something like, you must give us two weeks notice of termination, then you've just locked the company into providing two weeks notice whenever you terminate someone. So don't have that policy. If you give your terminated employee a notice period, then their actual date of termination is moved to the end of the notice period date. That means they're still considered your employee, eligible for benefits and workers comp until the actual end date. Now, alternately, you might just want to pay a notice amount in one lump sum. The nice part about doing it this way is that the employee's last day doesn't get pushed out, so it's a bit cleaner. I see this happen a lot in RIFs. Another possibility is that you're just pushing out the date a couple of days so you can get the final paperwork and paycheck ready. Something like you're going to tell them on Monday that Friday is their last day. Generally, I would suggest just waiting until Friday to tell them. But if there are other reasons you want to notify them early, then I say simply pay them for those five days and don't require them to continue to work. It's the easiest and cleanest way to go. Another decision you have to make is if you want to pay severance. Severance is an extra amount or other type of consideration paid to the terminating employee. Most often, a severance payment is tied to a separation agreement. The separation agreement is a contract between you and the terminated employee. By the way, it should be drafted by Labor Council. And it says, I'll give you this in exchange for a release. So I'll give you three months or two weeks or two years of severance in exchange for your releasing the company from charges of wrongdoing. 
Keep in mind, severance doesn't have to be actual salary. It could be an extension of benefit coverage. But either way, I always advise clients to get a signed separation agreement in exchange for anything they're providing over and above. Otherwise, you're just giving away free money. Now I know that separation agreements show up in the news periodically, but remember, just like most other things, they can be used for good or evil. Having a separation agreement doesn't mean you or your company has actually done anything wrong, but it does provide a bit of protection from being accused of doing something wrong. And there are a lot of protections employees retain, even if they sign a separation agreement. For instance, they can still bring charges of discrimination. Again, you are, of course, not required to get a separation agreement, but you should discuss it with your attorney. I almost always see separation agreements and severance during a reduction in force. Another thing I see in job eliminations are some sort of assistance with outplacement. After all, if someone loses their job because the company has to restructure, doing everything you can to help them get on their feet is just the right thing to do, and good karma. Maybe offer to make a few calls or put their resumes out to your network. It's up to you, but it certainly builds goodwill. Making the decision on when the term is effective will also impact how you handle security. Are you going to cut off the employee's access while you're having the termination conversation? Or are you going to wait? It's important to think through what you want the actual term day to look and feel like for both you and the employee. I always strongly recommend that you have all your ducks lined up and ready to go. So as you're having the conversation, system access is terminated. And if they have personal belongings, offer to gather them up and ship them versus making the employee stuff a box after they've just been fired. Now on to documents. Most states have required notices that you have to give terminating employees. There are also generally guidelines on when you have to give them their final pay. For instance, in California, you have to give the termed employee all compensation that's due, which includes vacation pay, no later than their last day of employment. There are exceptions. We have a 72-hour rule around resignations. But if the employee is terminated by the company, you're always required to pay them right then and there. In fact, the regs say you have to hand them their check on their final day. All direct deposit elections become null and void on termination, so it actually is supposed to be a hard copy check. And if you miss the deadline, you have to give them an additional day's pay for every calendar day that's missed to a maximum of 30 days. It's California's waiting time penalty. Different states have different rules. For instance, in New York, you can wait until the next regular payday to pay final wages, so it's important to double check the rules for your state. Now, if they have benefits, you have to make sure they're getting COBRA documents so they know how to sign up and pay for continued coverage. And some health benefit plans have portable coverage, meaning that you can take the coverage with you. Life insurance often has portability. In that case, there are also notification documents to include in the term package. You should always include a cover letter confirming the final date of employment and when the benefit coverage under the company plan will end without the COBRA extension. And it's a good idea to have a checklist of company property, keys, ID cards, laptops, cell phones, etc. So you can check off what's being returned and both the company representative and the employee can sign off and that form can go in the personnel file. Now, I'm almost always asked, can I hang on to their final check until they return all the equipment? Or the variation, can I deduct the cost of the equipment from their final check? The answer is no and no. You can't hold someone's final check hostage until they return something. Federal law considers this two separate issues and they can't be commingled. And while some states may allow deductions in very narrow circumstances, most do not, including California. And even with that, Federal law won't allow deductions that would result in paying less than the minimum wage, so there are lots of guardrails around attempting to make a deduction for equipment. You should absolutely consult your employment attorney before doing it. Another document that might come into play is a reference letter. HR professionals like me will tell you all references should go through HR or senior management, and they should only be name, rank, and serial number. 
or better yet, that the company should have a policy of not providing references at all. But since I know that both of these are unlikely to happen in the real world, the next best thing is a reference letter. What we're trying to get at here is a uniform response from the company on that employee's performance. Because we don't want someone you have to let go for bad performance getting a verbal reference from a manager at your company saying, Sally was the best thing since sliced bread. Aside from sending a mixed message, it's a mixed message that could cause you some legal problems down the road. So, a reference letter makes sure that the message is consistent and has been carefully drafted. And another thing to keep an eye on are online recommendations like LinkedIn. Remind managers that employee references, endorsements, and things of that nature should be cleared through the company. It may sound strange, but managers are acting as representatives of the company when they give a reference or an endorsement. So, there are two types of termination discussions you might have. One when you have to eliminate the position, or a very different one if you're terminating the person for performance-related reasons. I'll get to the job elimination or RIF in a minute, but for right now, let's look at the termination for performance. The main thing to remember when you're thinking about termination discussion is that the goal is to make sure everyone maintains their dignity. Always talk about the performance, never about the person. Don't use always and never because that's probably not true. And remember that just because their performance didn't meet the expectations for this job, they may be outstanding at a different job or different company. Also, think about approaching the discussion from their side as opposed to that of an adversary. As you know, we have had discussions around the performance expectations for your position. Unfortunately, the performance continues below our expectations. As a result, I have to terminate your employment effective today. We've put together a package of documents that will provide you with additional information and included your final paycheck, which pays you through today. Thank you for your work. I'm sorry it didn't work out, but I wish you all the best. So-and-so will go through the package documents with you, collect your keys, parking pass, etc., and make arrangements to send you your personal belongings. Again, thank you for everything. Then, let the designated person, maybe HR, maybe your assistant, sit with them and collect the items and close out the meeting. A few things to keep in mind. If you feel like you want or need a witness to the meeting, then let HR or your assistant or someone on your team sit in. And go with your gut. If you feel any discomfort around having the meeting, ask Building Security to stand by. The vast majority of terms go as planned, but only you know your employees and I believe in listening to your intuition. And I'll say it again, the goal is to let everyone maintain their dignity. Don't relitigate the issues. But when you said this, then I did that. It doesn't help. And the decision has already been made. And take it from someone who, as a baby HR manager, presided over a four-hour termination. Uh-huh, four hours. Do not let the following happen. Do not let the conversation devolve into a back and forth. Do not let the employee wander from desk to desk saying goodbye. And do not even think about changing your mind. Do make it short and move through the process. If you're doing a reduction in force, again, have all the documents prepared. Speak to the team member one by one if at all possible. Remember dignity. Let them know their position, not them personally, but their position has been eliminated. And again, get through the meeting and process efficiently. Do not ever terminate someone via email and try very hard not to eliminate someone via phone or video. Now I know that sometimes a call or video can't be avoided, but remember it's always best to conduct a termination in person. Once the employee has left, you should let the team know. I've made the mistake of missing this step in the past and it doesn't do any good to team communication. You don't need to go into detail. Just let them know Sally has left the company and we wish her well. Then move on to the next steps. Who's going to replace her or how the work is going to be divvied up. And where appropriate, be prepared to notify your clients. Again, something like Sally has left the company. We wish her well. Your new representative is so-and-so. Remember, 
Clients are much more interested in how and if the change will impact their service, so make sure your solution speaks to their concerns. I know letting someone go isn't any fun, but if you follow the four D's, it makes the process a bit easier. If you found this information helpful, please subscribe and share. And remember, your inspired leadership is the secret sauce to having a high performance team and a wildly successful business you'll love. I'll see you next time on Leader's Journey.